Right, let's go. Hello guys, welcome to an episode of The Biofiles with my two co-hosts, Dids and Jack, myself, Ed, and we're going to be taking you through some interesting and topical news stories in the world of biology, which we hope you'll enjoy listening to. So, Jack, do you fancy going first? Uh, Yeah, sure. Um, So, what I've been looking at recently is uh, these things called self-disseminating vaccines. Uh, which is basically where you create a vaccine which will spread itself either by putting some kind of liquid onto the fur of an animal and it will pass it on to all its little buddies when, they, when they're cleaning each other and stuff, uh, or potentially as well creating some kind of uh, virus which can pass on the, uh, the like relevant proteins or whatever which will train uh, the, the immune system to fight off whatever disease you're trying to, to get rid of. Mm. How is that different from a normal virus, like a virus which just goes around infecting people and then gets passed on to someone else? Well, there are two main ways of doing it. One way is similar to the vaccines we already use uh, normally, which is just a weakened virus or an attenuated virus. Um, So they just knock a few genes out or they find a weaker strain, uh, which won't cause any illness, but it will teach the body how to defend itself. Um, or another way is you can get a completely different virus, which is completely harmless, uh, but very good at spreading itself within a population. And then you can literally just stick uh, one or two genes from the virus that you're trying to uh, eradicate. Uh, and hopefully the the vector virus will spread to all the different people in the population or the different animals in the population, uh, express this protein, uh, and then the immune system will hopefully work out how to defend itself against those proteins. And yeah, it's been it's been quite effective. Uh, they've been using transferable vaccines for a while uh, in rabies, uh, just by spraying animals, uh, and then they pass it on to their little buddies. Uh, because there are loads of loads of diseases out there, like COVID potentially, uh, depending on who you believe. C bombs already uh, dropped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> Two minutes in, yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, like COVID, SARS, HIV, Ebola, like they're all diseases which started in an animal population and then uh, jumped over to humans at some point. Uh, so the idea is that if you can keep the prevalence of these diseases low in the animal populations, then there's less chance of them jumping over to humans and potentially causing like a worldwide pandemic. Do you think we could ever get to the point where you like, vaccinate animals so much that they don't share disease to humans at all yeah i think i think it's that's definitely like the aim of of this uh this like approach to uh disease prevention is the idea yeah you get the prevalence so low in the animal populations that the chances of an infected animal coming into contact with a human uh Mm is very low and then even if they do come into contact the chances of them passing it on are also very low would you think like the impact that would be oh sorry the impact that would have on um like a human disease kind of incidence do you think it would have like a significant effect which thing it would reduce by like 10 percent uh i think it'd be hard to put a number on it especially since i'm i'm definitely not an expert Mm. Um, but I think, yeah, like I said, there are so many diseases out there which uh, are past come into the human population in this way, and because we all live in massive cities now, diseases just spread spread so quickly as we've seen with COVID. Mm. Um, so I think if if we can prevent this kind of uh, uh, sort of disease uh, transfer, um, that would definitely help the population. Uh, in the future and avoid pandemics like this which have just ruined the economy and ruined everyone's last two years basically as a general school of thought they don't want vaccines mutating at all or like viral um uh like capsules i suppose that we use to like put things in bodies and animals and stuff they don't want those mutating at all because there's always the threat that could become its original pathogenic self 
Yeah, that's that's that is a a risk that needs to be considered because um that actually happened with the oral polio vaccine. It was just a weakened version of polio that they, you know, spread through the population to or no, sorry, that it w- it was like a vaccine program where they give you a weakened version of polio. Mm. Um but the problem they had was eventually over time this weakened version uh mutated back to its original self. Um, so it just became regular polio, and people started getting polio from the vaccine. <laughs> so, um, so, what the the stocks which they had of the weakened polio, like they're mutated in the stocks, or once you'd inject it into the into the patient, then it was no, yeah, so not in, not in the stocks. It was it was, yeah, they they injected people with the weakened virus, um, and then within because the virus was essentially still living in these people. Um, but it was just it was meant to be non pathogenic, but then just by a few random mutations it was able to get back to the sort of pathogenic state where it could actually cause some damage to them. Um and in a few isolated cases, they those people then started spreading regular polo polio to other people. <laughs> How long ago they, was this? Uh some twenty twenty. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was like the early ish nineteen hundreds. I can't. I can't remember exactly when it was. No, no one's proposing at the moment to use transferable vaccines in humans because it's just, it's a bit too risky. It's a bit early days, and um, obviously the ethics around it. You know, people don't like regular vaccines at the moment. Yeah. Has um is it being used on animals at the moment? Are there any like live um like trials which are going on, or even just programs? yeah? There have there have been some trials. So they've. Uh, one of the trials they've been doing is uh, in wild rabbits. Uh, there's this uh, disease called hemor- hemorrhagic fever, uh, which basically ca- causes loads of internal bleeding. Uh, really quite an unpleasant death for the rabbits, I'd imagine. Um, so, that yeah, they've been trialing it in rabbits, and it seems to be working well. Uh, one slight problem they've noticed is sort of the opposite of the polio vaccine is it tends to, because it's a recombinant virus, which means it's it's a completely different virus that's had the relevant genes sort of spliced into it. Um, they've found that over time, it will sort of lose those genes because those genes have no uh, like evolutionary advantage, essentially. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the only issue they've noticed is that um, it will sort of lose its function after a while, like after it's been through a few generations of rabbits, basically. Um, they do that's no breeding like rabbits, so generations of rabbits do come quickly. They do. They're, <laughs> they're mutating quick. So, uh, <laughs> All right. They're I mean, that's away. terrible. But yeah, let's segue away. Let's do a, uh, a stop codon, the first feature of the show, where mm-hmm. a, um, we, we, divert, we digress from the main topic to break it up a bit so i've got a question for you guys is back in last february guess how much covid vax or virus there was in the world so like if you were to compare it to a house like if it could fit in a household object which could be like a little thimble a mug a a (laughs) one liter container how much how much vaccine do you think there are virus sorry do you think there was in the february last year in the world? In the world, yeah. Are we taking into account, like, every strain? So this is back in February, yeah. So I don't know how many trains... I don't know what we were on it then, if it was... Probably it's only Delta, on Delta. Yeah, yeah, was it just Delta then? Yeah. There was... Yeah, but there were loads of unreported ones. Or, like, loads of ones that didn't make the news. So that's that's what these... So this article has taken that into account. It's taken the unreported cases. Okay. It's taken your viral load. They're really small, but, like, there's loads of them. So... I don't know, maybe, like... Maybe a, a bathtub yeah. across the world. Like a full bathtub. What's that, like 20 metres? I don't know how big a bathtub is. No, it'd be way, that'd be like, I want to say 300 litres. If you think of a backpack, a backpack's In like... a bathtub? A backpack's like 60 litres, isn't it? A big a big Ooh, backpack. A like, big one? Yeah. Yeah, bathtub has got a lot. That's a big volume. Although you don't think of it as... Yeah. I'd say maybe like a football sort of volume. One football. There's 180 liters in a bathtub. Check yourself, sir. 300. How big's your bath? <laughs> I've actually. Is that a Roman <laughs> bath. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I like to bathe in in style. I like to swim around. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Mine's actually a, it's a swimming pool. I'll go. Yeah, swimming pool. Um, I, I, I'm going with a bathtub. According to um, this article, which it was a a dude who got asked on I think BBC Radio Four, and then he did like I think he's a mathematician, and he took in all the the different variables, and you're saying this is still a massive like estimation, so who knows? But um, his prediction was around a Coke can. Other other fizzy drinks are available, but around a. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so a Coke cans worth of um of of COVID apparently was in the world last February, so they were going for predictions of three million people who became infected, which is by a um a website called the the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluations. So that was so they were saying that although there was only I think a million reported cases of COVID a day, they were predicting there'll be three million in total. So I looked at what it's uh, predicting at the moment. Yeah, forty million cases of COVID a day at the moment. So what's that? What's thirteen times? So that's ten. So that's what ten Coke cans. Which maybe you can have a small bath in ten Coke cans. That's no, that's three point three liters. That's quite a lot of virus in the world. Uh, yeah. At one when point, you think about how small the viruses are. Yeah. What would that look like? I don't know. Are you. <laughs> It'd be like a bull pit or like a sludge. That's the thing. I I don't. You'd never be able to just collect a virus in a can. Or like just pull them all together. I just I wouldn't work, would it? I guess it's just protein. So like, it just, like a shake. To be just... fair, it would probably look like protein powder if if it was literally just virus and now. Like uh, yeah, because it would be dried and stuff, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's so weird. <laughs> there's a slight divergence. That's how much COVID is potentially in the world. Again, massive estimates. Who's this mathematician? Let's give him a shout out for all our listeners. Um, we'd like to shout out right now. Uh, Heather Cro- Heather Croker, I don't know. We shout them out though. Big shout. Well, there you go, Heather Croker. <laughs> <laughs> if that is you, Heather, well done. <laughs> if not, then welcome to Firefast, <laughs> a podcast bringing you factual news topics each week. <laughs> I've just read. I just read about that um, polio vaccine mutation. Yeah. In 2017, there were only six cases of wild polio reported anywhere in the world. And by wild polio, they mean like um, polio virus found naturally in the environment, naturally occurring. So you can see that sort of polio. stuff in safaris, can't you? You go out and yeah, if, pay if a lot you get of to money the right to... cage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just don't make sure it doesn't sneeze on you. Uh, <laughs> and then the article continues. By contrast, there have been 21 cases of vaccine-derived polio this year. So the symptoms are like really similar but laboratory tests show that they're caused they're caused by remnants of the oral polio vaccine that have gotten loose in the environment mutated and regained their ability to paralyze unvaccinated children so it the like the header of this article is mutant strains of polio vaccine now cause more paralysis than wild polio but yeah that that is like the risk because that was that that vaccine it was literally they i think they put like a few drops on your tongue and then you know you were you were vaccinated, and even that has managed to become like a transmissible disease again. So I suppose that is one thing to consider if we tried this. But that's why they're only trying it in animals for now. Dear is. Um, <laughs> right back to back to vaccine, Jack, or the self transmissible stuff. Uh, have there been other any other attempts to do it in humans apart from with polio? Uh, well, they've never attempted it in in humans. Um, like the polio vaccine wasn't a trans, uh, it wasn't a transmissible one. It was just like a regular vaccine. Ah, that okay, yeah. Became regular polio again and sort of started infecting people. So this probably won't make it in, but yesterday I was having a talk from someone in my um lab group, and they were talking about a virus called no, a bacteria actually called I think it's Photorabus. I made a note of it, so I shall see what um yeah, Photorabus. It's the only known luminescent i think they're called like a terrestrial bacteria like one which is on the ground so like which can be seen by humans at points and um back in the american civil war there was a a fight or a, a battle where like some of the injured soldiers seemed that they're, like saw that their, their cuts and grazes were glowing oh, i heard about yeah that. i've heard about that yeah, yeah and they, they called it angel's glow because it yeah, like the people who had the glowing cuts recovered really well, and they they think it's this theorised that the um this photorabus bacteria because it's got loads of antibacterial properties in it because it wants to kind of survive and win, be the best. Um, 
yeah, they think it might have been due to that. Uh, it, it's luminescence causing that, and that's uh, why the that is sick. Yeah, which is awesome. I've just I've just seen that it's um it's it can it's been used as a biopesticide in agriculture as well. Oh, nice. So like you could just you could you could have your field just lit up with this bioluminescent. Did you say it's a bacteria virus? It's a bacteria, but it like bacteria, produces this like virus looking um virus looking protein. That is sick. Anywho, anywho, should we move on to our our next news story of the show? Yeah, yeah. Do it. Did you fancy going next? Yeah, mine's quite a quick one, really. Um, he only lasted like eighteen days, or however long he lasted. So. <laughs> <laughs> quite morbid, really, isn't it? Mm. Um, yeah. So my topic was uh, on the man who was given a genetically modified pig heart um, as a kind of last ditch option to deal with his failing heart. David Bennett, who had terminal heart disease, um, was given a genetically modified pig's heart uh, because he, I think, he failed his previous treatments or they weren't successful, and he was eligible to have a human transplant. Um, I think for reasons of uh, addiction or, or whatever. Was the reason of past. was the reason of killing someone in his in the past? No, that wasn't. He didn't I don't kill think him. He was... just paralyzed him. How did he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't go bashing him, man. Sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> it'll paralyze you. Polio. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I don't think it was because he was a criminal or anything. He did his time. He did his. He did what he had to do. <laughs> It's fine. Uh, it was it was because he had a failure to comply with uh, like previous treatment protocols for something else, I think. So they couldn't obviously like waste the heart if he wasn't going to play ball. Okay. Um, but basically, he got this genetically modified pig heart, uh, and it was like the first of its kind, uh, well, for like a major organ like the heart, uh, as a transplant, and uh, it was all looking promising. And then he survived for two weeks, um, and then died. Unfortunately, he was 57 years old. Um, it's longer than two weeks, wasn't it? Wasn't it two months? Sorry, yeah, I meant to say two months. Which is, that's incredible, though. To have a heart on, It's a pig's heart. Is it, yeah, a part which has been made in a pig and then survived for two months. I think that's still just amazing. A really simplistic um, description of the pig's heart is just that it is grown in a pig, obviously. They grow up the pig from, from birth, but it's been genetically modified to... Um, present certain genes uh, and like kind of hide others or so like suppress others um, so that it can better avoid an immune reaction in the uh, transplant or the transplant person so the, the person who's receiving the heart, the heart so Mr. Bennett in this case because that's, that's uh, one of the biggest problems with transplantation isn't it is that when rejection yeah your, your body recognizes it as a foreign being such as yeah. how it recognizes bacteria is not meant to be in your body so it starts producing a immune response against it and starts killing like this new heart which you have. Mm-hmm. So these, and obviously, these kill yeah, your these... heart you're dead. <laughs> Just pretty simple. <laughs> Heard it here first. Um, <laughs> so the what the gene modifications are trying to change or have changed the proteins which are expressed on the heart, mm-hmm. so that your body then sees these proteins as like as its own proteins and thinks okay, this is good, this is meant to be here, we don't need to do anything yeah. about this. Yeah, uh, I, so this one, um, I don't believe was like patient-specific, so where you just said it shows proteins that are like David Bennett's proteins, that's not actually like correct. It was more that it suppressed like the pig identifier proteins. I guess like the, the way that the body would interpret that is that there's just something here. Um, it's not foreign, but... I guess it would just then assume that it's theirs, but it's not presenting David Bennett's proteins, so it's not patient specific. It's just that it's not identifying as something else. But uh, they to the immune system. They added some human proteins though, didn't they? Not specifically his proteins, but some like, yeah. human identifiers almost. Ones yeah, which you'll find but... in every every person's body. Yeah. yeah. So again, like generic to to a human, um, but not to David Bennett, so it's not specific. Because because then you start looking at like personal personalized medicine like personalized growth i was reading a spin-off article about um 
uh, the future of organ transplantation and it's obviously regarding uh, stem cells and growing organs from someone's stem cells because then you have no fear of rejection because even though the organ or whatever you're producing is uh, done externally so outside the body it is biological material from let's say David Bennett or from me or Ed or Jack like it's from them and so it won't be rejected when it's put in the body or the theory is that it won't be rejected when it's put in the body on that note should we should we do a, another stop code on should we say why they're stop codons as well with because a stop codon <laughs> yeah you can say that a stop codon yeah. is the last bit of your dna like last three bases of your dna which shows your replication machinery to uh stop producing the protein not protein stop reading the dna sorry so like it'll get to that point and then your your machinery which is reading this dna then goes all right I've, this is a stop code and we'll stop there and we don't i think dids came up with the name so if you don't like it you can get get in contact with dids so jack do you have one for uh do you have one for dids i do indeed so mm. who can guess when the first xeno transplantation was attempted and a xeno transplantation is just transplanting an organ or some tissue from one species to another so into human from an animal into a human basically was it 1906 very close ed i've got a document in front of me which has the (laughs) 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 as that's gonna be that's gonna be very similar to my stock gun so i shall i I won't say anything well yeah but was it 1905 it was 19 (laughs) (laughs) year before did guess uh, but oh, yeah, pretty close. It, they it it actually kind of works surprisingly. They literally just they sliced up some rabbit kidney and transplanted it into this little boy who had uh, chronic kidney disease, um, and it actually worked really well for his kidney disease. Um, but then, yeah, unfortunately, they didn't have our modern technology, so his body rejected the transplant pretty quickly, and unfortunately, he died. But six it, sixteen it, days later, though. So yeah, was... sixteen days. Yeah, which I mean, that's pretty impressive to live with like another animal's organ inside you, semi-functioning, doing the job that it should do. I don't think we can Just... quite say it was another animal's organ though, because it was like it wasn't a kidney as you would see a kidney. It was kidney slices, wasn't it? So did they like kind yeah. of line his kidney with these slices of kidney? That's actually quite impressive though, when you think about it. like. like a because like I was saying, like the kidney does have quite a intricate structure. So I'm surprised just shoving a bit on there like actually helps cure your kidney disease. Yeah, well, well it, I guess it's... It, it didn't. It killed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it worked as a kidney. It just didn't work as a, as a part of his body. His body didn't like having it in him. Researchers at the University of Cambridge have, uh, for the first time, rebuilt a whole working human thymus um, outside of the body. Wow, wow. And the idea is, I think somewhere along here, I'm paraphrasing aggressively, but it says like you, in the future you could potentially do a transplant of like a heart and also the thymus because the thymus regulates like reception and rejection of well the immune system, which is obviously influencing reception and rejection of like transplanted tissues. Um, and so they think like if you put in a, a rebuilt thymus as well as the um, organ that you want to replace you can kind of skirt around the rejection a little bit. Oh, okay. Wow. But I think it's sick. I think that's really interesting. I love the idea. I love stem cells and um, personalized medicine, like growth for uh, like new organs. If you want an organ, or it's almost like Amazon for body. <laughs> or organs. And... I don't know how, um, do you know like what the structure of a thought, like, are thymus nah. is structurally like really intricate, or are they just basically a lump of meat that spits out? Got no idea. I, I, proteins. No, no idea. Because yeah, I, 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 like I wonder for stuff like livers and kidneys, where they're sort of filtering. They're mm. they're literally like a biological filter, and they've got really intricate, uh, like structures. I wonder if, I wonder how long it will be before we can make those kind of structures, just like in a lab in a test tube, or like. On a petri dish. <laughs> oh, you um, funny you say that. You can actually do that um, on organ on chips, <laughs> but you couldn't. I don't think you could culture like a transplantable organ on a on a chip. 
just a throwback to our previous episode if you haven't listened to uh, the first episode of Biofiles where we do talk about organ on chips and Dids gets quite boring because he talks for a long time (laughs) I'll link you my dissertation Um, you guys can contact Ed (laughs) right should we move on to the (laughs) the final final part of the show which is uh, my one this week or this past like couple of months since the last episode i've been reading about hpv and that's the human papilloma virus and that's because there have been some recent studies which have followed up the vaccine which was introduced in 2008 which is the hpv vaccine which is offered to school years of around year eight to i think up to year 11 um primarily it started off being in just girls and then it's changed to boys as well since i think 2018 now boys are being given the vaccine as well so it's quite incredible. It's reduced the incidence of cervical cancer by 87%, according to this study, in those initial uh, sets of pupils who, who got this vaccine. So human papillomavirus is one of the only viruses known to, to man which can cause cancer. And that's because it, it works by entering the, the basal layer of cells. So in your skin, on your epithelial cells, you have kind of quite a few different layers and you might have heard like kind of the top layers of your skin are, are dead, I think they, they say. And then the bottom layer of these cells is where HPV enters the body. So it, it enters through microabrasions and then they kind of go into the go into the cell. They hijack the cell's machinery, which prevents them from, uh, it's like increases their, their replication rates. And they also suppress uh, anti-cancer the tumor suppressor genes, which are P53 and PRB, what they do is they search your DNA when you're replicating and they look for uh, misre- misreplicated DNA, which have mutations in them. And if, they're, if they can fix the mutations, then they get, they get kind of ironed out and so you've got healthy DNA. But if there's too many that it can't fix and it sees the cell is kind of abnormal, it will then just cause the cell to die. But HPV suppresses these proteins from working, which means that when these cells are regulated, uh, replicating and it's increasing their replication rates they're more likely to have mutations in them and these mutations can then cause cancer which is why hpv is a a virus which causes cancer because it prevents the suppression of these mutations and in the majority of cases i think in 90 percent of um hpv infections your body will like complete will clear it yourself Uh, and hpv can cause i think it's estimated to cause up to 100% of cervical cancers, which the fact that you can vaccinate against a cancer is is huge and is really exciting. And um, there's also been things in the news recently about how the the smear test, which is um, carried out to detect for HPV in um, participants or in, in females, that's been elongated from every three years to every five years. And that's because they are testing not just what the cell looks like. So originally it was looking at the cytology of the cell, which is its shape and kind of if it looks abnormal. And if it does, then they'll do further tests. But now they're actually testing the DNA of these cells. So they're they're sequencing the the cell's DNA to detect if they have what are known as the high risk variations of HPV. Because there are so many there are over a hundred different types or like strains of HPV, but there are two high risk ones which are HPV sixteen and eighteen. So if they detect DNA from 16 or 18 or any of the other uh, high risk strains, then they will then do further tests. Um, do you lads have any stop codons to to introduce to do here? Uh, no, I don't. Unfortunately, I've been looking for one uh, for a good one because my one, my one was stupid. <laughs> nah, go on, go for your stupid one. My uh, my stop codon was um, what cell type was sent into the International Space Station last year to assess effects of microgravity. What's that got to do with HPV? Well, that's what I said. It's going back <laughs> to my one. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to go for a liver, a liver cell. Ooh, I'm going to get some guess. kind of bone cell to see how Bones. it affects like bone density and stuff. Mm, well, I can tell you that you're both wrong. Uh, and they were heart cells. Ah, uh, well, that's a throwback to yours. Up. Of course, it's going to be a heart uh-huh. cell. <laughs> I gave you a hint. You did give it away. Did they That's find anything interesting? Or uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> this was in 20, uh, 2017 it went up. 
So it could well still be there. And you're just floating about. So if if they can catch it earlier in that sort of like pre-cancerous stage, is there a, is there much they can do, or is the vaccine the only real way of combating it? So I didn't actually go down this route of research so much, but I think once you have the cervical cancer, you can't you don't really treat the the vac- the virus. You're more treating kind of the the mass of cells which are being produced and trying to prevent that from spreading and getting worse. But yeah, HPV also causes um, not just not just cancer, but things like warts as well. So, you know, like, did you ever have a wart when you were a child? That was probably HPV because it works in the same way. It gets into these micro abrasions, they're called, so that it can reach your, your basal cell layer and then causes those cells to kind of continually divide, which then causes this mass of wart on your uh, on your skin. And there are things called planter warts as well, which I think they're, we call them verrucas in in England. That can plantar warts. Plantar warts, yeah. Which are usually, plantar. they're found on the feet or the foot. Mm. And these have been known to to shed, to kind of like some of the skin comes off. And that can then remain on the floor. And a month later, you can still then catch HPV from that like shed bit of wart. That's mental. Yeah. <laughs> which is grim. Well, I used to always wear shoes in public uh, showers, like public showers and swimming pools and stuff. Yeah. Like, Athlete's foot, plantar warts, mm. they're just things you don't want. They it's can just uh, gross, isn't it? gross. Um wow. it does just seem like an incredible virus, and apparently it's been around for almost as long as viruses have been around. Like it's I th- I think it outdates the human population, like the humans, this virus, because it's found in so many different animals as well. It's found in, like fish, pretty much all manim- mammals, birds. This is found can everywhere. You, can you catch fish warts? Uh like HPV from fish and get in and then get like warts in humans. <laughs> it was just like a little fish scaly, uh, little scales. Just oh my god, <laughs> That's gross. Yeah. no, you like can't. Game of Thrones. Yeah, the um, you can't. They are they are very species specific, so like you wouldn't be able to pass mm-hmm. it on to a different species, a different animal. It is very humans will stay in humans HPV, and okay. yeah, fish HPV will stay in fish. That's quite weird though. Like if it's been around that long, the fact that it causes cancers like you think it would have sort of evolved out of that because it's not good for the virus if you die of cancer mm. like it wants you to stay alive and pass it on to other people so i'm surprised like over the billions of years it hasn't realized that you know it's not a good idea to kill your host the killing of the host is such a low like very, very prevalent yeah problem. it's like the frequent... not even one percent of the billions of cases it has every day not to mention the billions of years that it's been around yeah that's true like, yeah the actual percent of people it kills would be like minimal and i think the it's, it's evolved to suppress these cancer genes which hasn't been seen in a virus um or isn't isn't found in in other viruses so it can yeah suppress the cancer genes which then causes the replication of the cells hpv kind of incorporates its genome into a human's genome when the dna is read to divide it's then producing more viruses that way as well Mm. Um, okay yeah that makes that makes more sense yeah i was trying to work out like why it's advantageous to give your host cancer but yeah that may if it if that's how it like replicates is to like take away the limit of how many times your cells can replicate and just Mm. create loads and loads of versions of of itself then yeah can see why it's it's crazy like i was i was looking earlier um at the sort of policies in america because in america they're actually seen more keen on this on hpv vaccinations than we are um and even i don't want to generalize but certain states in the u.s where i would have thought like they were quite anti-vax um they're actually either proposing or they already have legislations in place where you're not allowed to go to public school if you haven't had the HPV vaccine. Really? Which is pretty pretty um, extreme, I, I think. That was really extreme. For, yeah, especially mm. for, like, again, states which I, I would have thought would be quite opposed to, you know, mandatory vaccines for every kid to have an education. I think um, I think probably should wrap, wrap things up. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of The Bar Files with Jack, Diz and myself. 
Ed, and we look forward to talking next week or next time about uh, three more interesting topical science stories which we've been reading. Find interesting, and I think you will too. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Bye.